Uh, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome our first speaker, uh, who is Professor Stefano Aliberti from the University of Milan. Uh, and he's from the End COVID Clinical Research Collaboration, which is a uh, project I'm sure he will tell you about, but is an ERS project looking into the problem of long COVID. Um, Stefano, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Professor Chalmers. It's really it's really a pleasure to to be part of this kind of uh, of meeting uh, uh, organized by uh, the ELF, ERS, and Dragon. And um, I, I'm really enthusiastic uh, to to share our perspective. My 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 job would be to discuss a little bit about the latest research, but I don't want to bother our audience. So I decided to uh, organize my presentation in, uh, uh, in a three different uh, session. The first one would be to give you an idea about the uh, kind of research uh, methodology that had been applied for long COVID uh, uh, evidence. And then um, I will touch a little bit, a couple of studies that I think might be recent studies that I think might be uh, interest to our audience. And finally, I will uh, discuss about the holistic approach in the management uh, and uh, the role of uh, uh, the um, ERS and COVID CRC. So, uh, the uh, as we as we mentioned over the past uh, hour, uh, our the um, the respiratory tract is the uh, preferred site of infection of the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, however, we have learned, listening to previous speakers, that um, COVID-19 is a really complex uh, systemic disease uh, affecting uh, uh, different uh, cardiovascular, uh, renal, uh, hematological, uh, gastrointestinal, uh, um, CNS uh, systems. And uh, uh, we have also learned about a plethora of symptoms that uh, uh, might persist uh, in patients uh, uh, surviving uh, uh, severe COVID-19. And this is the reason why we are now uh, discussing here uh, about the post-acute and the uh, long COVID uh, uh, syndrome uh, that have been proposed uh, early after the, uh, the, the pandemic. The point is that uh, only recently uh, we started um, looking at uh, data at a one year follow up. So the first message is that our knowledge uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, prevalence, uh, risk factors, uh, management and impact of outcomes of different uh, sign and symptoms of the long COVID is evolving. Uh, so at the beginning, we were talking about uh, 12 weeks, then we talk about six months, then nine months and now 12 months. This, um, this is a map uh, uh, concerning uh, all the different uh, publications and the distributions of studies uh, targeting the long COVID worldwide. Uh, and the message here is that, as you can see, uh, data about long COVID are coming uh, from uh, most of the uh, big countries all over the world. And uh, uh, publications uh, are targeting uh, different human body systems. Uh, not only the lung, but also the liver, the blood, the gastrointestinal tract, the dermatological one. So we, we are having a, a good number of data uh, in terms of uh, distribution of, uh, a sign of uh, uh, evidence uh, on sign and symptoms of long COVID across different newborn body systems. Uh, however, uh, if you take a look at the number uh, of studies that uh, specifically target uh, different organs, and this uh, uh, has been shown by, the, uh, by this graph, you see that in the majority of the cases, uh, uh, lung diseases uh, uh, and uh, thrombosis, uh, stroke and neurological diseases have been uh, uh, the uh, topic of interest of the majority of studies on potential long-term complication after COVID-19. And so this is the reason why uh, we should uh, focus also uh, to increase the number of evidence uh, looking at complication uh, uh, for other uh, very important uh, human uh, districts like the, the psychological one, uh, the central nervous systems, uh, or even uh, the liver disease. The, um, this is a, a pretty recent uh, uh, meta-analysis that uh, is in a preprint format, so uh, not already uh, published by uh, Lopez-Leon and co-workers. 
uh, up to uh, January 2021, uh, more than uh, 18,000 uh, publications uh, identified uh, with the idea of uh, looking at the uh, complications of uh, COVID-19, 15 studies uh, uh, evaluated uh, and uh, uh, 55 uh, long-term uh, effects uh, uh, estimated on uh, more than uh, 47,000 uh, people uh, enrolled in these studies. Nine studies were mainly from UK and Europe, three studies from the US, and one from Australia, China, Egypt, uh, and uh, Mexico. Uh, the key message of these uh, latest uh, uh, research is that uh, um, up to 80% of patients uh, uh, that have been infected with SARS-CoV-2 actually develop uh, uh, one or more long-term symptoms, including uh, uh, fatigue, headache, uh, uh, attention disorders, uh, ear loss, dyspnea, and uh, as we as we previous, pre previously mentioned. So as soon as this systematic review meta-analysis will be, uh, will be uh, reviewed and will be published, uh, this is an incredibly important uh, amount of information for us. However, if we uh, take a look at the quality of the evidence, uh, according to the different uh, sequelae and organ uh, evaluated in uh, people who survived from COVID-19, you see that, uh, for example, for uh, uh, data on pulmonary fibrosis, which is a, a well-known uh, complication of COVID-19, we only have a small observational st status. While we have a large amount of observational studies looking at the lung function and the impact of dyspnea. In terms of cardiac involvement, uh, for example, uh, the myocardial inflammation, which is something that we are really interested in now uh, because uh, we are starting uh, evaluating more in depth this complication, uh, is, uh, was mainly based on a case series while uh, the um, evaluation of the function of the heart uh, in terms, for example, of dist the dist diastolic dysfunction have been evaluated through uh, multicenter observational studies. And in the majority of the other, uh, the other area, like the hematological one, the neurological one, the renal, or even the systemic evaluation, you see that uh, we, are only uh, we are always based on observational studies, so we don't have have <clears throat> very well done interventional studies that can change uh, the, uh, the trajectory uh, of these uh, uh, complications. And in some cases, uh, we still are based on data coming from case series or even uh, case report. Uh, this is, um, this, uh, is a, the second message I would like to share with you. Uh, as a take-home message, uh, which is just one of the examples uh, of a patient-led uh, research. Uh, this is, a, a, is an analysis of uh, um, prolonged COVID-19 symptoms. Uh, it's a survey uh, by a, a patient-led uh, research team uh, that uh, came out uh, um, at the beginning of May 2020. And uh, the goal of this uh, research was to um, capture uh, the big picture of all the different experiences uh, of patients suffering of, uh, from COVID-19 uh, with uh, prolonged symptoms. So this was a survey uh, and the survey content and the survey analysis have been patient-centric. So the, the questions, uh, the survey questions uh, and the symptoms were uh, curated by uh, patients, uh, by patients themselves. Uh, patients uh, expert in research and in survey design, but the analysis was also conducted by the patient themselves, uh, both qualitative and quantitative uh, data analysis. And this kind of approach is really, really important, especially for COVID-19, because patients experiencing symptoms are in need of uh, uh, timely research and uh, content uh, relevant for them. Uh, that might not be um, expressed by uh, a physician-led research. So this is really important. In terms of uh, common manifestation of COVID-19, we already uh, discussed a little bit about that. And uh, we know that uh, um, uh, it's a multisystemic disease involving the neurological, uh, the psychiatric, the cardiovascular, the pulmonary, cutaneous, and a general a systemic kind of uh, sign and symptoms. 
And uh, um, if we want to uh, summarize uh, a little bit the uh, post-acute COVID-19 complications by organ systems, uh, uh, we uh, touched uh, in the previous uh, presentation most of the sign and symptoms, uh, especially uh, the pulmonary one uh, in terms of diaspnea, in terms of hypoxia and decreased uh, exercise capacity, in terms of hematological uh, complications like thromboembolic events, in terms of palpitation or chest pain from a cardiovascular perspective, very important uh, anxiety and depression, uh, uh, PTSD and sleep distur disturbances in up to 30-40% uh, of the patients who are COVID-19 survivors, um, renal, uh, uh, renal dysfunction, uh, endocrine dysfunction, uh, some gut microbiome alteration, we have uh, uh, some, uh, I, some good hypotheses about that, the air loss reported in 20% uh, of COVID-19 survivors, and uh, um, the, my presentation is mainly on adults, but uh, uh, we should also think about the impact on children and the so-called multi-system inflammatory syndrome with some very important data uh, that came out over the past few weeks. We also have uh, a, an idea about uh, predictors uh, and risk factors for uh, long COVID. Uh, this uh, published in the International Journal of General Medicine uh, a few days uh, a few days ago. It's a nice review also for patients that uh, uh, can put together uh, not only the prevalence of complications but also risk factors. So we identified uh, uh, older patients uh, and different complications according to age. Uh, we can use abnormal lab results uh, uh, during the acute phase, but also after the acute phase as a predictor for long COVID complications. Uh, we know that patients with previous underlying uh, disorders or comorbidities uh, might uh, uh, be more affected than other, one, than other patients uh, uh, for uh, complications. And then we also have um, Michelinus factors uh, that should be always uh, individualized on the single patient. So there are very nice research on trying to identify risk factors where the, uh, the implication uh, for us as a physician uh, is to individualize the right path uh, to monitor and to follow up properly the patient, not only after the discharge from the hospital or not only after the acute event uh, in the hospital, uh, but also after three, six, nine, 12 months, or even uh, we don't know now, but uh, two years, for example. Uh, I'm a pulmonologist working uh, uh, in the working in Milan, Italy, so I would like to uh, share with you a couple of slides about pulmonary complications. Uh, we know we discuss about risk factors and we know that there are patients at high, highest risk for COVID-19 pneumonia complication. These are patients uh, managing the ICU or in the eye dependence units. Uh, patients who are discharged on long-term oxygen therapy, patients who receive during the hospitalization or after the hospitalization a positive pressure uh, through um, continuous uh, through CPAP or um, non-invasive ventilation. So we tend to um, we tend to follow uh, more closely these patients during our uh, follow-up. And uh, from the beginning, uh, these are uh, data uh, in, of 2020, we knew that there were uh, CT features in COVID-19 um, that we were able to recognize not only the, during the acute phase, but also after hospital discharge. The importance of uh, uh, the CT scan um, have, been, uh, um, have been put under, under, the, under the, the focus uh, of us as a clinician and researcher at the beginning of the pandemic. We know that the CT scan can help us in identifying all the different aspects of the impact of pneumonia in terms of reticular pattern or ground glass opacity or consolidation during the acute phase and up to four weeks. And at the beginning of the pandemic, this is, uh, this is, um, this is a perspective we published with Paulo Spagnolo um, in, in, in 2020, uh, we um, started thinking about uh, an evolution uh, of uh, the lung abnormalities into a pulmonary fibrosis for those who were hospitalized uh, for uh, acute respiratory failure and RDS uh, due to COVID-19. 
with a percentage is up to uh, 20 and 40 percent uh, of the patients. Uh, also, the, um, the cardiopulmonary recovery after COVID-19 uh, is very important. This is uh, one of the uh, latest studies uh, published in uh, 2021 uh, in the European Respiratory Journal. Uh, I would like to show you this because this is a prospective uh, multicenter observational studies that um, systematically evaluated the uh, cardiopulmonary damage in uh, uh, patients who survived from COVID-19 at two time points after 60 days and after uh, 100 days, 100 days. And uh, through, through a questionnaire, but also clinical examination, laboratory testing, uh, um, lung function analysis, uh, CT scan, echocardiography, and uh, uh, what the, uh, the authors found is that uh, dyspnea was the most frequent uh, uh, symptoms, up to 36% of the patients, that there was an impaired lung function, especially in terms of uh, uh, reduced uh, diffusing capacity, but also there was a cardiac impairment uh, with a reduced uh, left ventricular function, um, and in sometimes also some signs of uh, pulmonary hypertension, but uh, these uh, were present in only in a, in a minority of patients. And uh, uh, the, they, they, uh, the good thing of this study was uh, to a comparison between uh, the sign and symptoms during the acute COVID-19 and the, um, then during the follow-up phases. Uh, in terms of the evaluation of the CT scan, uh, uh, this study presented a very nice uh, and uh, elegant analysis uh, uh, through the evaluation of the CT severity scores uh, done by radiologists, um, the evaluation of the pattern of pathological findings uh, through the CT scan, and, uh, um, and uh, the, the, these and other important studies uh, put uh, uh, the importance of lung function test and the CT scan uh, at the uh, top priorities in our follow-up of COVID-19 patients. Uh, this is another study looking at the lung function uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, demonstrating that uh, the impairment of diffusion capacity is uh, the most common abnormality or in the lung function test followed by a restrictive ventilatory defect, uh, which is associated with the severity of the disease, according to a different um, disease severity, from mild illness to severe uh, pneumonia. And uh, uh, pulmonary function test in general, not only a simple spirometry, but also diffusion capacity, capacity is now considered uh, in the routine clinical follow-up uh, for a specific uh, category of patients who survived hospitalization because of COVID-19. Another important uh, point of discussion uh, uh, is about uh, uh, long uh, COVID uh, complications uh, in patients, who have, in people who have been uh, managed uh, at home. Because uh, the long-term complications after COVID-19 are common in hospitalized patients, but the spectrum of uh, symptoms in uh, uh, milder cases uh, is, not, uh, is, not, um, is not very well known and uh, needs uh, further investigation. Uh, this is a study published in Nature Medicine recently where uh, the uh, scientists uh, conducted a long-term follow-up in a prospective court of more of up to 247 home isolated patients and also uh, 65 hospitalized patients in Norway. Uh, and uh, they found that at six months, 61% uh, of all patients had persistent symptoms uh, independently associated with the severity of uh, the initial illness. And uh, uh, they found that up to 50% of home isolated young adults uh, between 16 and 30 years of age, um, they had symptoms at six months. Uh, symptoms including uh, uh, loss of taste or, or smell, uh, fatigue, uh, dyspnea, uh, impaired concentration, but also memory problems. So these are important data, important findings uh, on young home isolated adults with mild COVID-19 who are at risk 
for um, long-lasting dyspnea and also cognitive symptoms. The other big chapter is about uh, uh, the, the follow-up. So the majority of the data are on uh, three, uh, six, nine months, but we are now having good data on one year follow-up. Like this one, uh, this is a study published on clinical infection diseases recently, uh, and uh, patients were included uh, at five months after the acute COVID-19 uh, prospective uh, design. Uh, patient followed until uh, uh, 12 months after COVID-19 uh, uh, diagnosis. And uh, uh, what they found is that after one year, 23% uh, of patients uh, were completely free of symptoms. So only 23% of patients were complete, completely free of symptoms. And the most frequent uh, uh, symptoms were exercise capacity, uh, fatigue, dyspnea, uh, concentration problems, um, problems uh, uh, finding words, uh, sleep problems. And uh, you also found that female, uh, um, female uh, uh, seems to show a significantly more neurocognitive symptoms than male. So uh, this is a big, uh, a big issue uh, about a one year follow up and maybe uh, one year and a half and two years. Uh, if you had the chance to look at this data, um, uh, it's a nice study because it's also comparing the evolution of the symptoms during the acute COVID-19 phase and then after five months, nine months and 12 months, looking at the differences. For example, uh, take a look at the anxiety or uh, the air loss. Uh, you see that uh, there is an increase or decrease of these signs and symptoms, which is significantly during the follow-up. And this is important for us because if we need to individualize the kind of testing to do in these patients, these are very important uh, data. Um, this slide is showing a podcast uh, by, uh, published in, in Nature, uh, looking um, identifying the importance uh, that uh, COVID-19 has in terms of uh, lasting disability or uh, ill health. If you had the chance to listen to uh, this podcast, um, I would like to uh, strongly recommend. And uh, uh, the, this is a, a podcast where the author discuss um, the, um, the, 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 um, there are public health experts uh, that uh, are evaluating uh, the impact on disability adjust life years, uh, the quality adjust life years, and uh, um, the new data that are coming out from the literature are showing that uh, uh, COVID uh, uh, can leave millions of people with lasting disability or ill health. And uh, um, the, uh, the speakers uh, are asking to um, change the lens uh, through uh, this perspective, uh, uh, especially uh, after, uh, after uh, all the data we have, uh, um, we have right now. Uh, the last two slides are about uh, the holistic assessment uh, that we as a physician are putting in place uh, in the patients uh, uh, in the post-COVID-19 uh, uh, clinics. Uh, we tend to assess globally uh, the patient, uh, but also uh, the lung problem, uh, breathless, oxygen requirement, uh, uh, fatigue, anxiety. And uh, the, the key message here is to try to uh, build up uh, a multidisciplinary COVID-19 clinic. Uh, there are plenty of these COVID-19 clinics uh, that are based on, um, on a, an interaction of different healthcare providers, uh, looking at the different uh, uh, body systems. So we have not only the pulmonologist, the hematologist, nephrologist, primary care, neuropsychiatric. Uh, so the, uh, the, the key of success uh, to monitor and uh, try to reduce the burden of long COVID complication is here, is into a multidisciplinary approach uh, between the hospital and the community, uh, working uh, uh, with a work between uh, healthcare, hospitalists, healthcare professionals, uh, and GPs, and try to um, try to identify uh, the uh, specific area uh, where we can do something for our patients uh, during uh, not only after hospitalization, but at least up to one year of follow up. So I would like to conclude uh, with uh, um, with uh, four uh, with uh, four major 
uh, questions that uh, um, might be uh, of interest for you. First of all, we know that uh, uh, long COVID exists, but actually uh, how many people get long COVID and who is most at risk should be a little bit more elucidated, uh, especially with a long-term follow-up, one year, two years. Uh, the underlying biology of some uh, of the long COVID sign and symptoms is not uh, completely clear and should be uh, investigated because here we might find uh, uh, some uh, targets for uh, therapeutic interventions that can change the trajectory of, uh, uh, of uh, our, of our uh, patient uh, history. Uh, thirdly, uh, what is the relationship between long COVID and other post-infected the infection syndromes is, um, is interesting because we know that um, most of the viral uh, upper, uh, low, uh, upper and lower respiratory tract infections might have uh, a long-term uh, effect. But uh, now we are starting thinking of something different for COVID-19. So comparing with, with different uh, situation, different viral infection might help us as a physicians and researchers to better shape uh, uh, the uh, management and the intervention for our patients. And finally, what can be done to help people with, with uh, long COVID in a practical way, in a daily based way uh, is really important. Uh, and uh, what I mean is to define, to, to design randomized control trials uh, of practical intervention that can change and can uh, um, ameliorate uh, the quality of life of people suffering of long COVID-19 uh, consequences. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is one of the, uh, the, 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 the experiences uh, uh, that um, are uh, worldwide, uh, um, that are present worldwide for, uh, for the uh, long COVID, uh, uh, for long COVID area. This is the um, European Respiratory Society and COVID uh, uh, Clinical Research Collaboration, uh, which is uh, a network of uh, physicians, patients, uh, researchers, uh, uh, but also, um, but also, pharma company uh, and uh, other stakeholders that want to work on uh, um, consequences of COVID nineteen infections, particularly in uh, patients who have been hospitalized, uh, with the aim of uh, uh, merging uh, uh, different national initiatives in Europe uh, uh, that are studying the long term effects of COVID nineteen, uh, and uh, uh, we want to uh, build an integration plan platform that uh, can allow us as a researcher to better interpret the data and to answer uh, COVID-19 related research questions. Um, there is a website, uh, you can Google this, just put uh, uh, ERS uh, and COVID CRC uh, and uh, uh, feel free to send me an email if you are interested in this and you want to cooperate. With this one, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, all the organizers uh, and I'm happy to take questions uh, uh, during the question and answer uh, uh, session. Thank you.